Certification is terrifying. It's unknown, it's expensive, and it's hard to know if you even have to do it. So in this video, I'm gonna show you the entire process that we went through to get the Lumen PMP V4 certified. If you're new here, a few years ago, I started a project around an open source pick and place machine, which automatically assembles electronic components on the circuit boards. And then shortly after, I started a company around selling them. If you wanna start the whole saga from the beginning, you can click here to catch up. Okay, before we get too far into this, I have to say, one, I am not a lawyer. Two, I am not a certification expert. Three, this is mostly an account of what happened to us and our process going through this. And four, you should absolutely go to a cert house and talk to a professional about this. A professional should advise you about what you need to do. I'm gonna skim over a lot of the details because otherwise this video would be an hour long. <laughs> also, if and when I say some things that are incorrect in this video, I'll keep the pinned comment as a list of errata and things that I said incorrectly with the correction in there. And I'll keep it constantly updated. So please check the pinned comment to be up to date on exactly the most accurate information about all this. This is just my account and I am sure as I record this right now, I'm going to say some things incorrectly. So, <laughs> I brought the Lumen up to a testing house about an hour north of Pittsburgh, where Opulo is based, called Keystone Compliance. And they were generous enough to let me film the whole process and do a bunch of interviews and stuff while I was there. So a huge thanks to the folks at Keystone for generally making the whole thing really cool. We were scheduled for four days total of testing and my tech Jeremiah ran all the tests throughout those four days. He was awesome. Okay, so which tests? What are we even doing here? The two certifications that we're going for in this whole process are FCC, which generally will cover selling an electronic device in the US and CE, which generally covers Europe. The point of these certifications is largely to check two things. One, that the Lumen isn't gonna mess with anything else electronic, and nothing else electronic is gonna mess with the Lumen. We're checking that it's gonna play nice, and based on what the Lumen is, Keystone determined which tests we have to run in order to be compliant. Again, this is a broad summary, but there are roughly four different types of tests that you run for these kinds of certifications. On one axis of this is conducted or radiated, which means does it actually involve physical contact or is it through electromagnetic waves? The other axis is like the direction of the test. So is the Lumen interfected by interference, which is called immunity, is it immune to other things affecting it? Or is the lumen making interference, which is called emissions, is it sending out bad stuff? It's like what's getting messed up is one axis, and the other one is like waves or wires, is kind of how I think about it. Again, broad simplification. Something that I thought was really funny is that tests are run in the order of least likely to break the device to most likely to break them, so you can like get the most tests in with the same device, which is kind of spooky and funny at the same time. The very first test we ran is called radiated emissions, which as you can tell from the little graph, it's does the lumen kick out bad waves? Pretty much. This means we got to put the lumen into one of the testing chambers at Keystone, which are as much as possible electromagnetically isolated from the entire outside world. Full steel enclosure, everything is grounded. The interior of these chambers are coated with electromagnetic absorption material, so any waves are very much not likely to be reflected, they're more likely to be absorbed. And check out this crazy bulkhead they have for passing signals in and out. If you actually have to have a conducted wire running in there, which ideally you don't, you pass it through this big steel plate and like, it's very intense. Even the room where you sit and like run all the experiments is also completely shielded, all built out of steel, fully grounded. It's, it's, it's kick ass. And then we have the Lumen run. I have a little script running on the Lumen that just goes through a simulated pick and place cycle. And this bolt shows us that the Lumen is working correctly and also kicks out the radiated and conducted emissions for testing. So for this test, we check to see what waves the Lumen is kicking out with this honking antenna. It's effectively listening to the Lumen and seeing what electromagnetic waves it's kicking out at what frequency and how powerful. And it's making sure none of them are like too strong or bright. Then the signals pass into this honking thing, which is literally worth $200,000. <laughs> and this is the $200,000 piece of equipment. Yes, this guy right here. And if we have like specialized testing or anything like that that we need to do, we will 100% mm -hmm. break this thing out. Yeah. But for the most part, we don't. Yeah. Because we're really afraid to break it. Yeah, <laughs> that's fair. It's expensive. Yeah. Thing. So we're probably only using a very small subset of what this thing can do with this test. That's how we generally use it, just to be <laughs> general, so. Sure, yeah. It doesn't make sense to yeah. bust this out for 30 minutes of testing. Sure. It takes 30 minutes to warm up. <laughs> right, so. yeah. I saw it when it... Does it still say it? Yeah, it says yeah. instrument warming up down, down the there. Yeah. <laughs> That's wild. And then it goes through a bunch of fancy filters and such. And then it pipes into their software where it accounts for all these different offsets and calibrations based on the wires and the antennas and all these other types of things. They do all this crazy calibration to make sure it's an accurate reading. The way it actually sends the signals from inside the chamber back out to the computer where we're monitoring all this is through fiber optic cables. What we'll do is we'll I'll actually fiber into this okay. to control it. Okay. Fiber doesn't emit anything. Yeah. That's why we use it. Sure. So. Yeah, it's the most inert way to communicate in exactly. and out. Yeah. 
And the fastest, what do you know? <laughs> and because the lumen could be kicking out waves in any orientation or direction, all of this antenna assembly moves. The pedestal that the lumen's on on this table actually rotates a full 360 degrees, and the whole antenna will even rotate horizontal to vertical. <laughs> So cool. Plus, the whole thing moves up and down along this track as well. And because motors would actually influence very greatly any of the waves inside this room and it would make the signal completely useless, all of this is actuated with pneumatics. And even further than that, it's not metal. It's all made out of wood or fiberglass. It's so weird being in such a high-tech room and then seeing a pneumatic piston with a bunch of like MDF. It's so weird, but you have to do that to make sure that it doesn't interfere. Okay, so then we run a test. First, we just do a really quick scan of the signals that the antenna is reading. Very fast, quote unquote fast. It still takes about 15 minutes. Then from that scan, we find the six highest peaks. And then we run a much more thorough test on just those six frequencies at every permutation of machine rotation, antenna angle, and and antenna height, which are called quasi-peaks, and each quasi-peak takes about 10-15 minutes. Then if the highest quasi-peak signal is underneath this red line here, which is what the standard dictates is acceptable, then we pass. If any single one of them is above, then we fail. The quasi-peaking stuff that we did earlier, yeah. it actually will raise the antenna to see where it's the highest, where the loudest noise is, and that's why the antenna goes up and down no like way. that. No yeah, so way, I didn't realize it, Whenever it's doing quasi-peak, it does it 360 degrees yeah. horizontally and then vertically as well. No wonder it takes so long. It's moving that antenna it's, up. That antenna's going all over the place during the I test. didn't realize that. Yeah. That's cool as hell. Cool, so all that's done, and that's just for one frequency range. This red TIE fighter antenna it only really works well for a certain range of frequencies, about 30 megahertz to about a gigahertz. For higher frequencies, we actually use a different type of antenna called a horn and do the same thing all over again. <laughs> this is detecting super high frequency stuff. This will go to up to 18 gigahertz. Okay. And then we'll get a really small horn. Well, not really small, but a smaller horn. <laughs> 40 gigs. Sure. Yeah. There are like three or four different ranges that we had to test. Radiated emissions testing alone took a day and a half out of our four days of testing. And it's also the hardest to pass. Electronics love kicking out electromagnetic noise. So keeping it quiet enough to stay within spec is really, really tricky. But we did it. The Lumen didn't kick out anything that was too disruptive based on the standard, and we passed RE. So cool. Okay, next up is radiated immunity. This is also with waves, but it's the other way around. We literally shoot the Lumen with electromagnetic waves and see if it does anything wrong or weird. All radiated immunity is, is you're basically creating a field through the antenna mm -hmm. and pushing that field into the unit. All it does is just try to couple onto the unit mm -hmm. and just tries to mess stuff up. Try and mess with That's things. That's all it does. Yep. yep. The setup is really similar. The lumen's still in a chamber with an antenna, but instead of watching the graph come in, we watch the lumen. There's actually cameras in the chamber that let us watch the device under test while we're running the RI tests to see if it still maintains normal operation while we're blasting it with waves. It was really cool and deeply stressful watching this camera feed. Watching the lumen picking and placing and rotating around, holding my breath to make sure everything still works okay. Hoping that something didn't go wrong, and it didn't. Across all the frequency ranges, the lumen kept on trucking and it was totally fine and we passed RI as well. Okay, that's most of the radiated tests. Then we move on to the conducted tests. These are actually run through touching the machine physically. The first one that we ran was conducted emissions. This one was pretty boring, honestly. I barely have any footage of it. We just hooked the lumen up to a fancy electrical outlet that listens to what noise it kicks back into the mains line and make sure that it's not gonna damage anything else that's connected to the same mains. If you have a good pre-certed power supply, which we do, this is generally not a problem and you just kind of pass. But the real spicy test is conducted immunity. This is the one where things can go pop. In this one, we effectively blast a ton of high voltage and weird power patterns into the Lumen's power supply and see what happens. Do we maintain normal operation? I'll let past Steven tell you about this. I shot this footage when I was at the hotel after one of the nights of testing. We are three days into our four day testing program and so far stuff is going really, really well and now we're doing a whole bunch of conducted immunity stuff. So today, right before I left, we were running a test where it would shoot 500 or 1000 volts into the power supply for 50 microseconds and then it would wait 30 seconds and then it would do another burst. And that pulse was either phase aligned with mains or it was 90 degrees off or 180 degrees off. And it was coupling line and ground and line and neutral and ground to line and like all the different permutations of stuff. And it didn't make it go pop. 
<laughs> which is pretty cool. And again, no issue. The Lumen took 2000 volts through mains. No problem, kept on working. And then finally, there's two smaller miscellaneous tests left. Technically, they're radiated immunity and conducted immunity, but they happen on a different workbench and they're most likely to ruin something, so we do them last. The radiated immunity test is called a magnetic field immunity. And it's pretty much just putting the lumen on a table and running a ton of current through a coil around it and seeing what happens. <laughs> you have to orient the coil at a bunch of different angles and just make sure that it continues to run appropriately. Again, no issues here, we pass this fine and supposedly most things do. But then, the final boss, the white whale, ESD. Literally zapping the lumen with 8,000 volts with this space age looking thing. I was so nervous for this test the whole time that I was at Keystone. And it was dreadful that it was the last one, so I had to wait all four days of testing until we finally ran this one as the last test. And we had passed everything so far up until this point. We did account for it in the machine circuitry, ESD protection on everything exposed, and even some stuff that wasn't. But still, it's terrifying. As with all the other immunity tests, we got the machine running, and we effectively see if anything weird happens with it while we hit it with interference. Oh, ESD. Great! <laughs> That's awesome! It's not as terrible as you generally think it is. Yeah. That's why I started asking you, like, about like your grounding and your plastics and stuff like that. Yeah. And that was it. There were a few other tests that I didn't film and I am glossing over a ton of the details here, but that is the bulk of what we ran. And we passed first try. I was completely blown away. It is pretty rare for this to happen. But the reason that we did was because of you all. Before we went for testing, I asked the review squad on Discord and a lot of GitHub contributors to go and look at the schematics for things for V4. Help me identify any potential issues and how to fix them. And we made a ton of changes to this new design as a result of all the feedback y'all gave us. There is no world in which we would have passed this first try without the Lumen PMP dev community. Thank you all so much to everybody that made a contribution in GitHub and chimed in in Discord. I cannot tell you how much I appreciate your consideration and your brain on this problem of making this work well. Okay, now the big question, money. How much did all of this cost? All right, so four days of testing and running the 13 total tests that we needed to run cost us $9,250. The test happened on a Thursday, Friday, and then the following Monday, Tuesday. Keystone is a bit of a hike, so I got a hotel that Thursday night and Monday night, so I didn't have to drive back and forth those two nights. So the hotel for those two, $92.75 a night, including taxes plus food and gas, the total was around $9,600. And this is just one bout of testing where we got everything right on the first try. And the Lumen also doesn't need a whole bunch of other tests that different types of products do require. And also, in my opinion, Keystone's rates were pretty reasonable in comparison to a lot of other shops that I got quoted from. If you have a few pesky tests that you can't pass or you need to completely redo sections, this testing can run you 25 grand, 50 grand. It all depends. It can be really, really expensive. And I think we got away with a really, really decent cost for what we were trying to accomplish. Okay, so yeah, that's terrifying. That's a lot of money. Even $9,600 is a lot of money. So what if you wanna do this too? If you're watching this right now and thinking about how you wanna ship your own product and you have to go through certs, this probably sounds pretty terrifying. Lots of money and time and it all kind of feels like black magic. And you're right, it is hard. But these tests are a good thing. These tests prevent someone from shipping a product that accidentally takes down critical radio communication or sends out an electromagnetic pulse that ruins every Xbox within a five mile radius. That being said, there still are a few ways to make this easier on yourself. Another way you can help make this a bit easier is you don't have to certify for all the agencies at the same time. If you wanna just start selling in the US, you can just get FCC certification, which is way easier than CE. Out of the 13 or so tests that we ran at Keystone, two of them for FCC, 11 of them, or for CE. FCC is much easier to do. And then once you get a little more cash in the door, you can pursue CE down the road, expand to Europe. There's a lot of different ways to play it. Here's past Steven again. This also could be done cheaper by a fair amount. My buddy Timon makes the Pionora, which is a breakout for the CM4 module for Raspberry Pis. And I was talking to him at the Open Hardware Summit about his cert process, and he found a shop that he was just able to send the device to with some boot instructions. They ran all the tests, he did not have to be there, and he got the thing back, no problem. It might only be the range of a few thousand dollars. Also, if you can help your device not having an intentional radiator or something that intentionally is putting out waves like Wi-Fi or Bluetooth, if you can avoid that in your device, it greatly simplifies and lowers the cost for testing. If you have to do it to make your device what it is, it needs it to work, getting a pre-certified module can help a ton. I'm not super up on all the details about how it actually changes what type of test you have to run. I believe some of these agencies will allow you to run a more limited scope version of some tests, but no matter what, 
you're putting something in your device that's already passed this before. So it's way more likely that it's not gonna introduce problems for you. I've been working on taking a lot of this information about the certification process and putting it together in a written format, which I've just published live on hardware.cafe. This is a website I'm gonna be maintaining and would love community contributions to about the process of doing all this stuff, codifying information about how to go about shipping a hardware product. So much of it is unknown and I want to help share how it can be done easier. A lot of this has already been covered in the OM podcast, which we've been publishing episodes about for a while now, but having a written codified version of this that's more community contributable is something that's really important to me and is live right now. There's a link in the description. If you're shipping hardware and you have thoughts, I'd love to see a PR help other people do the same kind of thing we're doing. And if you have any questions about any of this, I know I skimmed over a ton of this and I probably said some things that weren't quite accurate. Please leave your notes in the comments. I'll be responding to as many of them as I can with what I know. I'll be updating the pinned comment with errata. And also thank you all so much for your patience. This happened a very long time ago, <laughs> but I've just been working on getting a lot of this information put together and trying to figure out how I wanted to communicate all of it. I also have over a hundred gigabytes of footage that I shot at Keystone. So it's taken me a while to kind of poke through all of that. So everyone that's been asking me for information about certifications. Thank you for your patience. I finally did it. <laughs> all right, that's it for this one. Thank you all so much for watching, and I'll see you next time. Look at my fancy $65 a night hotel room.